It's been said that all of philosophy is a series of footnotes on Plato. I sincerely hope that's not the case, because if so, it doesn't say much for philosophy. Uh, I had a colleague uh, at New College, Oxford, a very distinguished ancient historian, who made it his life's work to try to answer the knotty question, who is the greatest shit of all time, St. Paul or Plato? <laughs> but I think it really could be said that all of modern biology is a series of footnotes on Darwin, and that's a genuine compliment to biology. I think many of us are fond of fantasizing about what it would be like to revive Charles Darwin and watch his dawning excitement as we bring him up to date on his own subject. And today, on Darwin's 204th birthday, my fantasy dream would be to introduce Charles Darwin to Sir Tom Blundell uh, and listen in on the conversation. I think that of all things in modern biology that might light up Darwin's intelligent old eyes, perhaps the most enthralling would be the remarkable facts of molecular biology. Darwin was, of course, thoroughly familiar with the detailed comparability of animal structures at the level of gross anatomy, how they're modified for different functions, and how you can compare them bone for bone, detail for detail, mapping for mapping, with different vertebrate skeletons with each other. This was and is knockdown evidence for common descent. But Darwin would have been riveted to learn that you can do exactly the same thing with protein molecules. The same principle of one-for-one -one mapping applies not just between proteins uh, across animals, but also within proteins, the, the different amino acids, and of course the DNA triplets that code for them. Darwin could trace the closeness of cousinship between any vertebrate and any other by comparing their skeletons in a one-for-one, bone-for-bone correspondence. He would have been astounded by the idea that you can do exactly the same thing with letter-for-letter, word-for-word, sentence-for-sentence correspondence in the voluminous literary texts that are in every cell of every living body. And moreover, the same kind of structure, function, correspondence, the correspondence between structure and function works at the level of protein molecules as well. The functioning of proteins is determined by the exact 3D, three-dimensional shapes into which the polypeptide chains spring, which is determined by their one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, and that in, in turn, of course, is, is determined by, their, by the sequence of, of DNA nucleotides. Darwin would have loved to be shown how it's possible to study the process of evolution at the molecular level. He'd have been astonished at the speed with which evolution races along at the molecular level. He'd have been intellectually delighted, although disturbed by the medical implications, of the way natural selection finds ways to evade our best medical efforts to cure disease, how natural selection actually works within cancerous tumors, for example, and produces very, very fast uh, evolution, as Sir Tom may well tell us. Darwin would surely almost burst with joy and pride in the achievements of his intellectual great-grandchildren. And of those intellectual great-grandchildren, he would surely warm to Sir Tom Blundell. Like Darwin, Tom Blundell is a man of superlative scientific ability, coupled with becoming modesty. Like Darwin, he's a man of strong and humane political convictions, although obviously um, tailored differently for their own times. He's a true original. Even Darwin didn't pay for his wife in cows. <laughs> nor, nor was Darwin a jazz trumpeter. Tom Blundell was an active left-wing politician 
uh, successfully active in my own city of Oxford. He's interested in art as well as science, in the relationship between them. I loved a phrase which he used in Desert Island Discs of all places, where he spoke of the symmetry and the beauty and the melody of science. He did his doctorate in Oxford. Uh, he worked with that extraordinary woman, Dorothy Hodgkin, whom I knew only from a distance as a, a sort of legendary, almost mythical figure. He was inspired by J.D. Burnell, uh, at, uh, who, whose chair he succeeded in, in um, Birkbeck College, Burnell known as Sage, one of the fathers of crystallography. Um, that was after a short spell at Sussex University. Um, he finally became the Sir William Dunn Professor of Biochemistry at Cambridge, uh, from which he's recently retired. He's always pursued a parallel, very active life in public affairs, especially as they affect science. Among many other things, he was Director General of the Agriculture and Food Research Council, the founding chief executive of the BBSRC, the Biotechnology Biological Sciences Research Council, and he recently came back as their non-executive chairman. He's been president of the Science Council since 2011, promoting the role of science in society. An immensely busy man, obviously, he even has his own company for de developing drugs to fight cancer and other things. I'm hugely looking forward to this Darwin Day lecture, and I hope you'll forgive my fancy if I imagine the ghost of Charles Darwin hovering over us and enjoying what I'm sure will be a fascinating Darwin Day lecture on the emergence of drug resistance, molecular evolution, and new medicines for cancer and tuberculosis. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Tom Blundell. Well, uh, Chairman Richard, uh, thank you very, very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you uh, for the invitation to come and give this very prestigious uh, lecture. I, I must say um, congratulations to the choir to begin with. I, I, I felt that I'd rather sit down and listen to them than come and give you a talk. And, and congratulations to Richard uh, for, for giving a a very wonderful summary uh, of the sort of things that I, I do. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a very fast kind of evolution that we can study with modern technologies. Uh, but I just wanted to begin by saying that um, on the Today program this morning, I, I, I was introduced as, as not somebody who um, is... Um, a fervent anti-creationist. Well, I just want to put it right. I am uh, an anti-creationist. <laughs> uh, 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 and I, I've had a relationship, I guess, uh, uh, with Darwin uh, since I was, I don't know, 14 or 15 and started um, reading a, a, about him, and with humanism uh, since I was... Uh, 15 in my little country grammar school, uh, where the teacher um, set out to tell me about religion using science as an example. It set me against it from that moment. So uh, I, I'm very pleased to come here to the Humanist uh, Society uh, and um, also to, um, to be a, uh, associated with it for some several years. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is indeed, uh, as Richard said, it's molecular evolution. It uh, runs very much in uh, parallel, underlies the evolution that most of us think about. But what I'm going to do today is to uh, focus on two areas. One of them is um, uh, cancer. And uh, again, as Richard said, uh, it, Tumors are really very fast evolving sort of subparts of you, uh, 
which seek selective advantage once they've been released from the restraints uh, of whatever the tissue was originally. Uh, and, and the point that I really want to make in this lecture is that working on TB, uh, and I started working on cancer, and I'll tell you later how I got involved in TB. It was because of Bill Gates uh, came to my company and said, can't you use the technologies on cancer uh, on TB? But uh, as I've looked at um, TB, I've realized there's a huge similarity in that uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, like uh, a tumor in your body, if you're unfortunate enough to have it, uh, takes on huge numbers of mutations, uh, just as uh, occurs, of course, in the evolution of all organisms. But uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis takes them on extremely quickly to evade uh, the, the human uh, response or the animal response um, uh, of its host. Um, and we can follow that now because we can sequence the genomes and see what's happening in fantastic detail. And that's uh, where I want to go in the lecture. I'm going to talk about these hugely complex uh, uh, events which uh, start off with a very complex architecture uh, of these very, very small objects, proteins, uh, so you can get um, really uh, tens of, uh, of millions of, across your thumb, so they're very small. Um, and within them, there's just a huge rate of, of mutation. And what we can do is put together the information from what's called second generation sequencing uh, with knowledge uh, of the architecture of these uh, to understand uh, the emergence of resistance. And uh, resistance occurs both in tumors and in, in, in MTB in a very similar way. And that's the point I want to make. Uh, but really my main message, and I'll come back to it in, in, uh, at the end of my talk, is that you can really see evolution in front of your eyes uh, occurring at a fast rate. Uh, but what is even more remarkable is that by understanding evolution, uh, you can do something uh, useful, and that is understand why we get resistance to drugs, and we can even think about making new drugs in the big fight uh, against both tumors and, and pathogens. So I'm going to take you on a very complicated journey, and I apologize to those of you who, who are not scientists. I try to make some generally uh, um, relevant points, but I have to go a little bit into the science uh, from time to time. So uh, let me begin by just saying a few words uh, about what is cancer, because um, uh, just to share a common ground, but I'm sure you know most of this. Uh, cancer is a broad group of diseases, um, all involving unregulated cell growth. And um, uh, one of them, well, you see here uh, lung cancer on the top on the right, and then a very different kind of uh, cancer, CML, the chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, and they have many things in common. Uh, they all are due to abnormalities in DNA, due to the very fast rate of evolution. The cells grow and divide um, uncontrollably, forming malignant tumors, and they invade, of course, nearby parts of the body, and also, of course, uh, more distant parts of the body through the lymphatic system and the bloodstream, and that's, of course, uh, metastasis. And, of course, as you know, one in three people in the Western world develop cancer, and one in five uh, die of it. So... What's happening in cancer evolution? So we can now look at this and we can understand how genome uh, within the cells in your body, uh, when exposed to mutagens, um, replicates incorrectly. We can follow that. We can follow the progressive divergence of the DNA sequence in each cell. And I should say, each cell in the tumor is different, and that's one of the things we're beginning to find out, and it's going to make it incredibly complex. 
And then, of course, somatic mutations, they're the mutations that occur in your body, eventually hit a critical gene, um, often an oncogene, and that provides a growth advantage. So that's the selective advantage that the tumor cell suddenly gains and allows it to compete uh, in, in the environment of your, of your body. And of course, this uh, results in the emergence of expanded clone derived from that cell. And then the additional mutations uh, lead uh, to metastasis. I thought I'd show you just one picture of something uh, that I work on, although I'm not going to talk about it in general today. And that is one of the oncogenes that uh, really lead to uh, metastasis. It's called the CMET oncogene because it was first identified uh, as an oncogene leading to metastasis. And uh, what it does is um, it mediates uh, the effects of, t of a factor called hepatocyte growth scatter factor. The scatter factor is important because it means that the cells scatter from where they are in the tissue and they often invade, invade the collagen matrix. And this is a rather wonderful picture, I think. Um, these are cells moving around as a result of having the hepatocyte growth factor. Um, and, and you can see they move at quite a rate. And I should say that this is a picture from my uh, friend and, and colleague, Emano Garadi, who's been in Cambridge for 20 years, but has just gone back to run a group in Italy. He discovered uh, with uh, Michael Stoke the um, uh, scatter factor, and it's just one example uh, of an oncogene. You can see that in a tumor, if you activated that oncogene, then the tumor cells would start moving, and that's what happens in metastasis. So we need to understand all of that, and um, we also need to understand uh, a, a little bit about um, uh, what's happened over the past few years. So in many of these oncogenes, and I've got an example here, that it's a little bit complicated, um, but, but um, there are uh, several what we call protein kinases, which turn out to be oncogenes. They tend to regulate pathways and, and growth. And uh, one of the most significant events in the battle against cancer uh, was just more than 10 years ago when the molecule called Gleevec, it's sometimes called imatinib, uh, it comes from a company, Novartis, uh, was approved by the FDA, and, and that had a huge impact on the treatment and uh, quality of life. It was a revolutionary targeted therapy, and patients with uh, this CML, this leukemia, have gained a much better prognosis as a result. Uh, but what's happened, of course, is that over the years, many of the patients have begun to relapse. And, uh, and so we, we see now, and I'm going to try and explain some of this to you, but on the right-hand side, you can see in molecular detail the effect of mutations which hit uh, or accumulated in this oncogene. And what they do is they block the binding of the drug. So this is the cancer fighting back uh, and it does it in a number of ways. I, I'll say a little bit more about this later. But one of the most obvious ways uh, is, is that it just blocks the site uh, where the drug I I is coming in. But it blocks it in a way that it blocks the drug, but not the natural uh, ligand, which in this case, for those of you who are scientists, is uh, ADP or ATP. So that's the story. Now, TB, uh, as I said, I got introduced to uh, and, um, uh, and so been learning uh, rather desperately um, at, uh, about it. it. It's, of course, uh, never diagnosed in many cases. We've got the BCG vaccine, marginally protects people. And we've had a, a drug therapy which has depended on these what are called first-line drugs on, on the right-hand side. And um, one of the problems with TB uh, therapy is it takes six to nine months uh, if you're uh, a normal person. But as soon as you get drug resistance, uh, then the time of, of treatment goes up 
uh, uh, tremendously. And um, uh, this is um, being complicated, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, uh, by the fact that um, uh, the compliance in many of the countries where TB is, is rife is incredibly difficult to, to, to maintain. And so you get people breaking from their uh, drug regime and you get resistance uh, growing. And the other feature which is quite amazing is after a, a big expansion in drug discovery uh, uh, around 30 years, 30, 40 years ago, um, uh, we've had only just one drug and last week uh, uh, eventually approved. There's been 30 years without any new drugs. And that's partly a reflection uh, of the fact that people thought it was a solved problem and it wasn't a Western problem on the whole. Um, but, but it's also because it's a very difficult target, as I found out in my lab, and I'll say a bit more. And this has become acute because we've got multiple drug resistance uh, occurring now. Now, of course, until very recently, it's not affected us in, uh, in the UK very much. My grandfather died of consumption, TB, um, and I was told that nobody else in the family ever would. Um, uh, of course, uh, what's happened is that it's grown, in, and in southern Africa, um, it it's, uh, has a huge death rate. That's been exacerbated by the lack of compliance. It's been exacerbated by uh, HIV. And, and um, I just want to make the point, uh, uh, Richard referred to the fact that I bought my wife with cows. Well, um, I'm married to a, a, a brilliant lady from Matabili land. Um, she's in the center there. She's actually a, a, a distinguished scientist with uh, and nearly 100 papers and seven in Nature and working in Cambridge. Um, but she came on her own uh, to this country. I'm afraid I didn't wander through Africa to find her. Uh, but, but when I uh, uh, had to go through some formal marriage ceremony, uh, I was told that I had to go to the great aunt the, uh, 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 and bargain with her uh, about the number of cows. And everybody's asked me how many cows, and I'm never going to tell anyone. <laughs> uh, 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 but I want to show you uh, this uh, picture here, because uh, on the, uh, either side of my wife are my two daughters. Uh, they've been uh, very lucky to uh, ha have a good uh, state education, I should say. Uh, one's uh, a, a medical doctor, just qualified in Oxford, and the other's rather successful commercial lawyer. Um, but we, of course, travel back uh, to Africa a lot. And uh, down here uh, are my two, uh, two of my great nephews. And, and what I wanted to say is that, of course, in that part of Africa, which is the south part of Zimbabwe near the border of Botswana, uh, um, uh, south part of Zimbabwe near the border of Botswana and South Africa, then you have a huge amount of HIV, about 40% uh, of uh, adult uh, population uh, are HIV positive. We've had one person in our family die of AIDS, um, and what has been particularly difficult is we've had a number of people with TB. So though I didn't get into the problem uh, from this route, I'm very, very much aware on a personal level of what the problems are. And so this question of, uh, of drug resistance, um, the, the uh, multi-drug resistance is defined as being resistant to two of the drugs, isoniazid and rifampicin. Um, but as I said before, uh, the problem is, is exacerbated because the patients often feel uh, better after a while. Uh, the drug supplies come out, uh, uh, run out or sometimes scarce. Uh, then people forget to take their medication and, uh, and sometimes patients don't get effective therapy. And, and so this has led to huge problems. The, the second-line drugs, um, the prices are lower now, they're off patent, uh, but they're pretty toxic. And so it's uh, even more problematic, and you have to keep people on an even longer regime. So this is an important problem uh, uh, for many parts of the world, but it's becoming quite a problem in the UK as well. Now, both of those cases are cases of evolution. And of course, evolution occurs through changes in DNA, 
uh, but I have to remind you that selection is not on DNA, it's not on proteins, it's at the level of the organism. But in order to understand it, we have to understand how it's uh, mediated, if you like, by proteins. So we have uh, DNA to protein, um, and, and what happens, uh, and this is actually HIV proteinase, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, but of course, uh, we have mutations occurring in the DNA, uh, and, and very quickly uh, you get lots of mutations. In fact, HIV is very sloppy in the way it converts uh, DNA eventually into protein, and so you have a huge accumulation of mutations very quickly, which is selectively advantageous. And I guess similar things happen in tumors uh, once uh, the, the restraints of the normal tissue are released. So if we want to understand all of this, we've got to understand the architecture of these proteins. And in order to see them, we can't see them with light. We have to see them with x-rays. And, and that's how I got into it. And I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, my history because it's an introduction to molecular evolution in a way. So I w worked in the 60s uh, on a pro problem which Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, which you referred to her, Nobel laureate um, for penicillin and B12, had started in the 1930s. I drifted into the lab. Uh, as, as Richard said, I was mainly interested in my modern jazz group, which I ran all through my Oxford days, and before that as well, and after that. Um, uh, and in, in, in politics, mainly in anti-apartheid uh, and the organizations related to that. Um, so I walked in somewhat innocently. Uh, people often ask me, uh, why after 30 years of Dorothy Hodgkin working on a problem, uh, did you think you can solve it? Well, well, that's not why I went in there. I knew a bit about Dorothy Hodgkin. I knew a lot about uh, J.D. Bernal, uh, and it seemed to be a great place to be. I was just lucky. Uh, because I was around then when we had a look at this uh, insulin molecule. And, um, uh, of course, um, Dorothy was a bit older. Here's uh, Dorothy and myself. Uh, I, I, I sometimes, uh, just to show you how long this problem took, uh, but also to show you how beautiful I was in those, <laughs> uh, those days, uh, and, and uh, how I fitted the image maybe of a, of a left-wing uh, jazz musician. Um, uh, but um, anyway, um, the first thing I thought about all of this was I was very lucky, and the second thing I thought about it was it was very beautiful. My grandfather was an artist, and I was delighted to see that thanks to the six molecules in the insulin up there and the 12 apostles, uh, they both had uh, threefold symmetry and had some similarity. Um, however, other things uh, began to cross my mind. But these were all interrupted because my politics and the big immigration into Oxford uh, of um, people from uh, Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh, and, and also from the West Indies, uh, ha had led to a lot of discrimination in the motor works. And I became active in the city in trying to um, uh, uh, sort that out. And the Labour Party in the 60s asked me whether I would stand in East Oxford, uh, in St. Clement's Wall, which is on the right-hand side down here. Uh, and um, uh, eventually I did at the end of the Wilson government, uh, and uh, every other Labour candidate left their seat. I had a huge number of, of immigrants uh, uh, on the door. I doubled the vote and found myself in charge of I, I think finance, planning, health uh, uh, um, in, in the city uh, um, and took over as, uh, after a little while of convincing the Labour Party that we should follow this policy. It was Morris Motors, of course, and I had a no-car policy. I eventually got them to oppose uh, the motorway and we took over Oxford City. And, um, uh, and this is Oxford. Uh, Richard uh, wasn't, I think, going to be affected by the motorway, which I stopped. But the one thing that nobody's tried to change in what I've done uh, in my life is was stopping the motorway. Nobody else has tried to drive one uh, across the meadow and into East Oxford. Uh, I pedestrianized the centre. Um, I, I got stopped by the minister 
who was called Speed, if I remember when I went down, uh, uh, from, from stopping, from shutting Magdalen Bridge. Uh, but I did manage to do one or two other radical things, including uh, make North Oxford in a conservation area. Uh, so those beautiful houses uh, got conserved. Um, but the point that I want to make is that all of this in planning struck me as rather like the cell. And there are lots of similarities. So um, in uh, the cell on the left, um, it, you have a complex organization with pathways and proteins. And the proteins are there. And in the city, I'm afraid this is not Oxford City, um, you, you have a similar complexity of, of buildings, which are rather like the organelles and the, and the proteins. You have very complex um, uh, building architecture. And, um, of course, on uh, the proteins, you have amino acids as a sequence, and in buildings, you have bricks and other things, but there's quite a lot of similarity. And um, so I once wrote a paper on joist braces and trusses uh, in, in protein structure. The, the referee said he'd never heard such a, an appalling non-scientific idea and didn't ever want to read a paper from me again. Uh, actually, Nature published it, thank goodness, uh, and so I've been uh, celebrating this, um, which I think is quite a useful analogy, but proteins and palaces, uh, and of course they're all connected by pathways, and this is very important to understand. So planning and architecture is central, and I just want to say very quickly a few things about that at the local level. But life got a bit complicated because I was trying to play my jazz, I was running the city, and I got several papers in Nature, and life uh, became impossible, so I left. And I went across Siberia uh, on the train, I got stuck in Kabarovsk, I moved to Japan where I, I actually learned some Japanese, used to be able to lecture in it, went down to Taiwan, listened to some Chinese opera, moved across to India, spent time learning Carnatic music, and I, I came back. And as I went on that, I thought about insulin and evolution. Uh, this was, um, you know, the hexamers that we'd seen, this is the six-fold symmetry, uh, are actually in the granules in, in, in your body, in the beta cells of the pancreas. Uh, we could make analogies of that. And I could begin to think about the organization and function. And um, so as I went, I also, I mixed science with music. Uh, I, I just show these two pictures because on the right-hand side is Cathy Hall, um, and she put on a concert in London. I met her 40 years ago on this trip, and she's running the, uh, the London Beijing Opera, uh, and, and then that, uh, that was in London. But uh, a, a few weeks ago this month, I, my old friend who's a Carnatic uh, uh, Vina player I got him to put on a concert um, where we had about 800 people in, in, um, in India around a scientific meeting. So I mixed all of this, um, but while I was listening to the music, I was thinking of the melody uh, of, of, of the sequences. And um, what I began to do is I realized I was in a privileged position because I, I had the architecture uh, of an insulin molecule, and that's on the right. I think you have to draw it simply if you're going to understand it. Um, and I knew about all of the sequences, uh, and, and Fred Sanger, of course, was in Cambridge at the time, had, had determined lots of sequences, and so we could begin to ask questions about evolution. And I asked them in a rather different way. I said, I know this protein structure, architecture, um, and I'm privileged to know a number of sequences that... Uh, Fred Sanger has, has, has um, determined. Not many other people were in that privileged position. So I could then ask the question, what uh, range of other sequences might fit into that uh, structure? And I did it by analyzing, uh, and I'd better swap over this, but various parts of the structure are rather like the braces, the disulfides in the, in the protein for the scientific. There was a core, which is the center of the architecture, uh, and, and then there were other things that I didn't really understand at first and began to make sense of. And so I began to think about protein evolution, and of course, you have a restraint on the organism where you're selecting, down to the individual cells, down to the proteins, 
which then, of course, put restraints on the uh, variation that occurs in, in, in the sequences. And um, so I could ask questions, and I thought about this as I traveled around this long trip. Uh, I, I realized that um, animals and many fishes uh, had this uh, hexameric structure. Some had just two molecules, like the more primitive hagfish. Uh, and then there were funny things, like the, um, uh, the guinea pig, which uh, never got round to having this beautiful organization. And uh, when I was uh, getting back, I, I started thinking about this, and um, I moved to Sussex and, um, and found John Maynard Smith uh, and thought I'd better go and read what he said. The first thing I picked up I didn't agree with, uh, uh, and that was a, 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 a book where he was describing what Moto Kimura, and I got to know him very well later, a very brilliant scientist, uh, but he started talking about insulin and neutral evolution, and I could see from my analysis of the architecture uh, that it was actually selection uh, that led to those changes. And so what I did is to analyze that, and then I, I uh, published a paper in Nature uh, debating, this was nearly 40 years ago, uh, uh, on whether it was Darwinian uh, selection or, or uh, selectively neutral mutations. Of course, it was both, but some of the things that Moto Kimura thought uh, were very high rates of, of change, he thought necessarily were neutral. In other words, they weren't affecting function, but in some cases in evolution, very fast change occurs after selection. So, and then I went on to think about the family and, and, and publishing a lot of speculative papers, which are rather nicely okay. So that's the background. You've got proteins evolving and the sequences changing of the amino acids due to changes in the DNA. And then you've got selection at the animal level, but coming down to the level of the protein. But another thing that uh, struck me about Dorothy Hodgkin is, though her husband was a member of the Communist Party and Dorothy was prevented from going into North America during the McCarthy period for her politics, um, she always used to go into Novo Welcome Eli Lilly. She had lots of friends there. So I was taken into these companies. And later on, I began to think, well, um, uh, it was obviously very useful to Dorothy, and Dorothy, I think, contributed uh, in the area of diabetes. I was later working uh, on uh, a, a rather dull set of enzymes uh, called pepsin, but there's a relative uh, called renin, which controls your blood pressure. And um, I, I found some rather remarkable things. So I've, this uh, is pepsin or renin, and you, you may not believe it, but the two halves of that, if I draw a line down the center, um, are actually topologically equivalent. Everything in the right-hand side is there in the left. So I wrote a paper with a lot of colleagues suggesting that that had evolved from a gene duplication. Um, and it was a fairly convincing argument I found, but the problem was I couldn't find anything around at the moment that looked like it, and I wondered whether it existed anywhere. So I used to go in the library on Saturday mornings and search through desperately looking for my uh, ancestral molecule still somewhere around. And then, to my surprise, we found it first in Rouse sarcoma virus, and, um, what, what, and then in HIV. And in HIV, uh, other people notice the analogy, but nobody else noticed uh, the, the implication that the HIV proteinase had to be uh, uh, two molecules together. And because I was working on renin and antihypertension, I immediately had the idea I could take my uh, prototype antihypertensives and try them in the AIDS program. So I went to companies and I told them, take your drugs from your lowering blood pressure program and try them in your AIDS program. They were absolutely amazed. Um, they, they were less amazed, uh, well, they were quite amazed when they found they worked, uh, not very well. Um, uh, but of course, uh, right in there was this pair of scissors, and it turned out that the pair of scissors was necessary uh, if the HIV virus, uh, you see, HIV comes in. Uh, here on the, on the left-hand side. It goes into the cell, it reproduces itself, and it produces a single polypeptide which has to be clipped up. 
like a, 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 a long string has to be clipped up in pieces. And so the virus, uh, HIV virus, before it gets clipped up, is immature and not virulent. So I realized that if I could block this step uh, of proteolysis, as it's called, I would have no uh, active uh, viruses. And, and so immediately, uh, because we knew the architecture of this, and, and uh, I was told off for speculating by all my peers, uh, so eventually I published in Nature again uh, the experimental architecture for this molecule, and, and um, that then provided the blueprint where I could think about designing a, a drug. And unfortunately, at that time, um, Margaret Thatcher asked me to head up a research council. So I was taken out, and then I was interviewed and told that I, 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 I had formed a small company. I, I was told that I uh, was now a government employee, and I had to close my company. I went to, that was, by the way, in DTI, I went to, to the Department of Education, and, 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 and they said, I hear you're an active uh, po um, politician. And I said, yes, well, they said, you can't do that either. So I realized at that stage that I couldn't be a, a Marxist entrepreneur. Um, uh, but um, uh, what I uh, did find is, is that the ideas we had were taken up by many companies, and many other people in parallel uh, were discovering the very similar things. That led to a drug, which is one of the cocktail of drugs uh, that keeps AIDS patients alive. And what happened, if you look at it, is the AIDS virus, the HIV, has responded by having mutations all over it in order to get away from the drug. So this is the problem, again, uh, of escape um, uh, from your drug. So uh, this is a paradigm, um, then, uh, for drug discovery, but we'll come back to the resistance. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to whip through. So um, w what has been happening in, since the early uh, 90s in making drugs is that uh, we take targets, often from the genome, we express the various components, uh, we do a large screen with libraries, this happens in all the large companies, and, and you get a hit. And what has happened, uh, basically, is that over the last 20 years, this model has proved not very successful. Uh, the cost of a drug has gone up to two billion. If you look at the increase of, uh, of expenditure on drug discovery, uh, it's uh, been exponential, but the number of new drugs has stayed the same. So one of the things I did when I came out of the Research Council was to think whether I could use my HIV experience uh, to uh, develop a new methodology, and that's what I did. Uh, really in this area here of screening chemical libraries. Now, I can't tell you very much about this, and I'm running out of time much more than I thought I was, uh, but we developed a method where we used very small fragments of drugs to screen and did this as an experiment. Uh, and eventually, uh, you get one of these fragments uh, which bind to the target, and, and then we use biophysical methods and chemical methods, gosh, you know, they do eventually uh, attach themselves. And we then use uh, chemists, uh, bring chemists, I'm not a chemist, by the way, um, to elaborate uh, these molecules and, and to form uh, a new drug molecule. And we tried that out in my lab, um, and, and then we got half a million funding. Um, we then, uh, it, it worked very well. Uh, Haran Jyoti, who is one of my ex-students, uh, came out of Glaxo and, and contributed hugely to this. I stayed as a non-executive. Uh, the two people expanded into uh, 80 and then 100. This is just screening with these fragments. This is the next stage of, uh, of the discovery process. So what you do is you use all this knowledge of architecture uh, to work out how to expand these small molecules uh, and to get a molecule which eventually uh, has high enough affinity uh, uh, to work in a whole animal um, uh, as a model. I'm going to whip through this, but um, what we've done is many targets in the company uh, moving uh, to very high affinity compounds and then trying them on mouse xenografts. This is a tumor on a mouse and, and, and show that this method works. But the main message I want to get over is that by having a knowledge of the three-dimensional structure and uh, we can design molecules that will fit in the space uh, in those molecules complementarily 
and block the activity. And just in case you think I'm just saying this uh, works uh, without evidence, I've got eight dr drugs in clinical trials. The company's now capitalized at 311 million and on the NASDAQ. That came out of two people in my lab. Um, so uh, it's quite useful. Um, and uh, also, we now have uh, second generation, even third generation sequencing. So we can take the amino or the DNA sequences and change them into amino acid sequences and have huge amounts of data. And I'm going to whip through this bit very quickly. We can organize the data in databases. Um, we can have assembly lines. And we can predict what the genome looks like in terms of its architecture. I'm going to go right through this. And we can also predict the mutation. So what we can do is from the knowledge we have of a small percentage of the genome, we can predict about half of the gene products fairly accurately and, and another 25% reasonably well. So we have a picture of the architecture of all, uh, 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 well, 75% of the genome. So something like mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. Now that architectural problem, we have a model. And so I can now begin to think about uh, the two problems of cancer and TB. Now in cancer, of course, uh, there are Mendelian type mutations, and they're ones that are inherited. And many diseases, like this is Berthold Dubé syndrome that I work on. I've got another group working on this in my basic lab. Um, and, and this gives you these little uh, benign tumors on, on your face. Um, if you become homozygous in it, it becomes a very aggressive tumor, and people die. So we've been trying to work out um, what the mutations are and how they affect uh, um, this particular kind of tumor. Um, another area where I've worked is in the breast cancer-related uh, uh, tumor, tumors, where we've known for a long time that BRCA1 and 2 are related to early-onset breast cancers. And what I've been able to do, uh, along with my colleague Ash, um, um, Ashok Venkataraman in Cambridge, is to map the critical mutations that occur and try to understand what's happening in these Mendelian diseases. They're fairly easy to understand, of course, very difficult to do anything about. Um, um, but we can begin to understand how the mutations affect the stability of these protein architectures. I'm not going to go through this. And then we can take individual types of, uh, uh, of cancer and this is a study I've done with Tim Eisen over the last five or six years, um, who's in oncology in Cambridge. And, and this is these very uh, uh, nasty renal cell carcinomas uh, in what's known as the von Hippel-Lindau disease. And we can track these through. And uh, oh, just take away from this is that the various mutations, we can begin to understand what they're doing in, in, and how the cancers originating. And what I can also do is, is to start thinking then about the more difficult problem, and that is the kinds of cancers that you get which uh, are not so dependent on the, the inherited gene, uh, but, but are often uh, really complex. They're like other polygenic disorders where you have a number of genes. Each one can exist OK on its own, but you put them all together uh, and they can uh, cause cancer. So what we've been trying to do there is to watch the evolution uh, of these uh, uh, tumors. So you can sequence the tumors using second generation, third generation uh, sequencing methods. And then we can see the huge array of, uh, of changes. And we've been trying to use our rational methods then to work out which are the drivers, because if we can work out what the drivers are, uh, then we can begin to advise on medicines. And, and here I've been very dependent on the Wellcome Trust programs, their cancer genome project, um, where they've been identifying uh, genes that are mutated and trying to understand their effects. So it, you can understand that if I can identify in a tumor, the driver, the mutations that are causing uh, the disease, I can advise the clinician as to which drug they should take. And that's the first ambition. 
uh, of all of this. And the cosmic database is just one of these databases which tells you what's happening in tumors and, and um, begins to, uh, to allow you to think about it in a rational way. And what I've done here is just to plot these massive sets of mutations on to one group of proteins, the kinases. And I can begin to say, well, look, some of them, the purple ones, I think are going to cause possibly some change in the cell activity, whereas the other ones are not going to be important. And usually what we have to do then is to go into experiment to test these hypotheses. But what it means is we get closer and closer uh, to understanding uh, the mutations in, in tumors. And I hope eventually we we'll then have a range of drugs that we can say these are appropriate uh, for these uh, particular kinds of tumors. So you can imagine, as in the Institute of Cancer Research in, in, in London, that you take out the tumors in the Marsden Hospital, you, you sequence the tumors, you move them into the fundamental science, and then you see what is happening, and you advise the clinician uh, which drugs to take, but you also say this is uh, possibly a new target. Uh, but of course, in all of these areas, you've got relapses occurring, and, and this is a problem. And what we've been doing in my lab uh, also, and this is one of my uh, young, uh, very, very intelligent students, Harry Jubb, is we've been trying to work out the effects of these mutations where um, uh, they have effects on function. And these are just some examples of what happens. On the left-hand side, you see um, a, a mutation occurring that doesn't affect the function. That's the ADP, ATP. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you see the drug Gleevec or Imatinib, and it does affect the drug. So uh, the, the organism has kept its functionality but rejected the drug. So what we can now do is take the methods that I was telling you about in our company and go back to this model, and, and we can work out a drug which will combat or be complementary, if you like, to the mutation it, 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 that occurs in the tumor. So it's a battle, you see. Uh, you find a drug, the, the organism, whether it's a tumor or, 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 or a um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, fights back and rejects it. You can then go back and redesign a drug. But of course, the, the uh, problems here are going to be huge because the expenses are very great. But in principle, we can do it. And so uh, the second generation drugs are already beginning to come for the very, very common mutations, uh, and that's an, an area where we'll be working. Just very quickly then, the same sort of thing is happening with uh, TB. So as I said, Bill Gates uh, uh, sent his man, Bill Duncan, uh, to our company, asked us whether we would work on TB and not just uh, oncology cancer. And uh, we, uh, as I said, decided to defocus the company. We moved it back into academia. Um, and um, uh, Bill gave us some money, quite a lot of money, and we've been designing uh, drugs against uh, TB as well. And uh, Bill Gates turned up in my lab. I once heard a commentator on the Today program say uh, that if you get 30 seconds with Bill Gates, uh, then you're very lucky as a journalist. We had him for two or three hours in our lab, uh, just an amazing discussion. Uh, but what, is, of course, is happening in TB is that the key first-line drugs, like isoniazid, uh, you're getting resistance to them. I think we better just ignore this. Uh, it's quite a complex picture, but what I want to tell you is that we know about the architecture that I've been telling you about. We know how the drugs bind, uh, and as we see the resistance emerging, we're beginning to think, can we design for the very common resistance mutations uh, new drugs? And so that's how it's, uh, it's going. There's lots of mechanisms uh, of resistance. I just don't have time uh, to go, but we can certainly begin to make drugs where the mutations are directly in the binding site of the drug. And so uh, the mechanism, uh, the, the conclusion I want to tell you is that with a, a, a fantastic group of people, and by the way, my, my, my lab's a bit lacking in English, we can do 37 languages in the group. Uh, um, uh, and, and we have everybody from mathematicians to medics. Uh, it's just a fantastic working environment um, and, and, and really exciting. And you can see 
why um, four years after I should have retired, I'm still getting up at four o'clock and, uh, and, and working in the lab early in the mornings. Uh, but I hope what I've been able to tell you is that evolution is real. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't. You can see it. It moves fast. We've got to understand it in many cases. It tells you about all sorts of useful things about the cell by understanding it. But in particular, if we can understand the fast evolution of both pathogens and tumours, we can begin to get a much more uh, sensible approach uh, to um, making new drugs. So I just wonder when one of these creationists is, is given a drug um, uh, for um, a, a, a mutated uh, a protein eventually when we get one, uh, I hope whoever uh, administers it will tell them that it was de designed because evolution is real. <laughs> and so I leave you with those thoughts, and thank you very much for being patient. Thank you very much, Sir Tom. That was a, a roller coaster. I'm sure Darwin would have absolutely loved it. Um, do we have questions? Can we have the lights up so a bit more so we can see? Hi, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, you said earlier in, in your talk that um, each cell within a tumor uh, may be individual and have many mutations. In a Darwinian sense, we might expect um, that single clones or single cells become more um, successful and the heterogeneity to decrease as the disease progresses. Yeah. Is this something that we see in cancer especially? Do we see a decrease in heterogeneity as it progresses? And how does that, um, how do the different metastases relate to each other in terms of that complexity? I, I really don't think we have enough <laughs> uh, uh, data yet. They're accumulating at a huge rate in the cosmic database and we need to relate them uh, in the way that you imply to different stages in the tumour, and that's going to be a major focus uh, both in the Institute of Cancer Research and the Sanger um, uh, labs in, in Hingston, and in the major centres like MD Anderson and Dana Farber and Sloan Kettering in the US. I, I would think your, your hypothesis is right, <laughs> and it would, if there's anybody young here, uh, it would be a good project to look at. <laughs> There's a question behind you, I think. Uh, with um, the common tumours, such as lung cancer or colon cancer, does each tumour start with a single mutation in a single cell? And if so, is it environmentally caused? Uh, so I didn't catch the first part, but almost all um, tumours will be caused by multiple uh, factors. And, and so you may have some underlying uh, uh, personal uh, changes in your DNA, and then you probably get other mutations accumulating. But it will be benign until you get uh, to this later stage of evolution of it. But and do the initial mutations, are the initial mutations caused by the something in the environment? Yeah. Or they do they well, certainly some of them will be, but some of them may be just mistakes in the system anyway. Uh, and as I say, they would probably be overlaying uh, particular uh, differences. Uh, they're called NS-SNPs. In, in, these are non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in, in, in the genes anyway. So it's going to be a complex interplay. I think it's very difficult in an early stage in a tumor to work out what's going to happen, as far as I can see from but I, I mean, there may be other people in the audience have more experience uh, in this. But it's an area where we're going to put a huge amount of effort internationally, uh, I, I'm sure, because we need to get an early diagnosis. And the, the other thing is, if, even if we uh, sequence every tumour, I, 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 I'm not sure we're not going to have to sequence individual cells in the tumour, and it's going to be quite difficult to, 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 to work out how to go from there. So I think there are many challenges, but it's a very, very, um, I think, exciting and optimistic um, uh, uh, scene at the moment. 
Yes. I wondered about a phrase you used because it appeared to imply an intrinsic intent by the cell undergoing evolution. No, you referred, I, I, can I, I finish my sentence? Uh, yeah, but I didn't to, mean to. <laughs> you referred to HIV making mutations all over the place to get away from the drug. Yeah, that, that, that's strictly wrong in every way. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it's difficult not to say it, but it's not how it occurs. <laughs> um, and you're right to, to, to pick me up on it. Um, I'm not a scientist, so this is probably a very simplistic question. It's often struck me, uh, for example, I believe they've got cancer cells from a woman who died about 40, 50 years ago. She's gone, but the cells are still alive. They're kept in an, Amer an American laboratory. I remember seeing it on the TV program. Mm. So the question that comes to my mind is, not that we all necessarily want to live forever, but of course those cells apparently have got the ability to live forever, even though the woman who had the cells is now long That's dead. Yes. The, question, the question I want to ask is, is it also possible to use your architectural approach to look at the positive aspects of these mutagens and pathogens and to derive from those potential benefits that could be applied to us so that we, in, in a beneficial way, begin to um, reflect those qualities in, in, those, in those individual areas of life, if you like. I, I think it's one of the most difficult challenges uh, really working out um, how to extend life and have healthy aging. I think we're way away from it. I mean, the HeLa cells you're talking about, presumably, uh, have been immortalized. Their life is not very interesting. My wife works on them. Uh, and um, I, my main tease of her is that she rushes into the lab in the middle of the night. I say, don't worry, uh, Lynn, your cells are immortal. <laughs> uh, 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 but they're not. <laughs> Um, yes, I, 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 of course we're learning a lot about what makes uh, life longer, uh, but we're a long way away f from it at the moment. The problems I'm describing here about a single mutation or two affecting a drug are hugely more simple than the kinds of problems that you're posing for us. Well, thank you very much, sir, for that very erudite talk. Could I just ask you a related question, which is, you showed a, uh, your slide about your travel all over the world, particularly in the East. And as we know, the three biggest killers in the East are HIV, malaria, and TB. And you've been working on T TB and uh, on mycobacterium and on malaria. Are we any closer to developing any vaccines against these three big killers? Um, I think, well, vaccines with HIV have been particularly difficult, and there's been a huge investment. Um, uh, TB, I, I think, is probably a, a better candidate for further work in that area. I, I must say, my vaccines are not my area uh, of, of work, um, but I, it's clear that for many areas, they, they will provide a very uh, good way forward. I, I think in the long run, um, we're, we're going to need uh, the classical type of, of small molecule drugs, but... but we have to look at both areas. There seems to be quite a link with um, hormones and the development of certain cancers, and I wonder what your views might be on um, either using hormones as a uh, treatment or also as a potential vaccine for some of these cancers. Yes, so it's true that, that many hormones and growth factors, I mean, insulin is both, for example, a hormone and a growth factor, really. Um, they, they, they lead to um, uh, growth of the cell, uh, um, and, and they do it uh, 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 through uh, various uh, uh, proteins which are uh, related to oncogenes in many cases. So there's obviously a close relationship between growth factors and many of the pathways. Um, I, I'm not sure you're going to solve the problem by stopping uh, the, the growth factors in most cases, although in sometimes you, you may be able to regulate the cells. But quite often the pathways are taken over. So 
for example, in the, in the MET case that I talked about, which leads to metastasis, uh, then uh, what you tend to get, and, and in many other growth factors, you, you, you get um, rearrangements that lead to overexpression or, or out of control expression. Uh, and I think they then uh, go beyond uh, the, the possibility of regulating them with a hormone. But I'm sure in many cases it, it would be worth looking at. But we need to know much more about which are the drivers in each tumour. Can I ask one I, while, while I, we're getting the microphone? Yeah. Um, an ordinary Darwinian adaptation at the organism level has perhaps even millions of generations to build itself up. Am I right in thinking that as cancer cells get better at being cancer cells, they, as it were, have to go back to scratch at the beginning of each tumour, so that there's only the time spent from the beginning of a tumour until the death of the patient in, in which the evolution can happen. So although it's getting better at being a cancer, it never gets to the sort of level of, of an eye or an ear or something like that, which has millions of generations yeah. to evolve. I think that's right. And of course, what tumours do is they abandon much of the complexity of, uh, of the cell's regulation uh, uh, that um, the cells that lead to the tumour. Uh, so it, but I think you do have a sort of classical evolutionary situation of, of one or two cells mutating and then being able to form clones. So you have multiplication very quickly. So you can establish a tumour uh, much more quickly than you can an organism in... The generation time is so short. It's so short and it's much less complex an environment, I guess. I'm afraid my question is a rather trivial one, but um, I, was, I was wondering what drove you to be a scientist and what would you say to young scientists? I, I drifted in. I'm not a typical scientist because I understand from my science council work that most students make up their mind between the, the ages of 11 and 14. Uh, I was still optimistic that I was going to be either an artist or a musician uh, uh, till I was about 17 or 18. Um, so, so I think you've, you've, it's, it's pretty hard and it's not terribly well paid. That's the problem. So you've got to enjoy it. Uh, but, but what is fascinating about it, and I hope you got this flavor, is, is you've, you've certainly got beauty uh, in, in uh, the sort of work that I do in any kind of science, uh, I think. Uh, you've got intellectual challenges, you've got excitement. Uh, I think one of the frustrating things is it's often very difficult to communicate it uh, to, to, to others. Uh, and you can see what a problem I've had this evening. <laughs> Uh, in regards to cancer treatment, um, your research is looking towards um, treating the protein produced by mutated DNA. Does this mean that um, these are lifelong treatments? These are treatments that people will have to take for the rest of their life? Or are you also looking at sort of actually fixing the DNA so that you can actually produce a cure to cancer? Yeah. I mean, all of the drugs that we're developing are really just restraining the cancer. They're not changing... Uh, the DNA, and, and that's the real challenge at the moment because most drugs for cancer will extend your life by months or years, uh, but they're certainly not a cure. But what you have to realize is that um, in, in a tumor, you've got 20,000 plus genes uh, and many more gene products, uh, and, and you're just making one or two very tiny mutations. And the problem of, of targeting the tumour without hitting the rest of your body is, is a real challenge. So most of the, the drugs are depending on the fact that the tumour is undergoing division and growing faster than the rest of the cells. Uh, so so uh, we're way away from uh, any sort of DNA therapy, I think. So my question was a bit related to this. Uh, since those diseases are very fast at mutating and very good at mutating, and um, evolving very fast, wouldn't it be more efficient to actually devise drugs that would prevent them from mutating and replicating so fast, instead of trying to win the race against those mutations? Yeah, but it's quite difficult to, to stop. I mean, in the case of, uh, of um, HIV, as I said, the whole system is much more sloppy, so you're constantly making errors. Of course, one of the other uh, problems is that you have a very complex DNA repair system. Uh, and uh, 
some of the things that tend to happen in tumours is the repair system becomes dysfunctional and then you have even faster uh, accumulation of changes. So it's a quite a complex business. It's a sloppiness quite often. It's mutations that occur. It's lack of repair and, and so on. I think uh, what you're saying, no doubt somebody will do, but I think it's, again, challenging. I'm sorry to be so negative, but this is a, just an amazingly difficult area. Uh, oh, that was a bad thought. Um, so this oncogene that forms in this sort of cells, does that occur naturally anywhere in the body? And the scatter effect, does that got any natural benefits? Yeah. So, so most of these oncogenes are, are there as natural... Uh, natural genes. They're just ones that, if the tumour mutates, uh, lead uh, to a particularly large effect on growth or cell division. Uh, but some of them are natural uh, genes where there's been a rearrangement. So uh, the, the, the target of the Gleevec imatinib one is, is, is a translocation uh, that brings... Uh, one uh, gene together with the other, uh, and, uh, and then it's, of course, turned on. So the bit that regulates it is, is, uh, is removed, effectively. Uh, so, so they're quite often natural genes uh, which have been upregulated or, or, or the regulation has been removed. And that's why it's so difficult to target them, because you know, very similar molecules are going to be in every cell of your... Uh, of your body. I think we've had a, a magnificent illustration of just how incredibly exciting uh, modern science can be, and I'd like to thank Sir Tom very much for this splendid exhibition. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.